Hello, this is the RPG Pundit, the final boss in Internet Shitlords. And uh, today, I'm going to be doing a walkthrough of Dark Albion the Rose War, because somebody pointed out to me in the live stream that I just did, the, the 3,000 subscriber live stream, by the way, if you haven't watched it, check out that live stream, it was a lot of fun. I answered a lot of people's questions, uh, hijinks ensued, and uh, <laughs> in any case, it's... Uh, it, uh, it was an opportunity for me to thank, and in case any of you didn't see it, and you've already subscribed to me, thank you so much for subscribing to this channel. And if you haven't, then please check this out, this video. If this is the first time you've seen any of my videos, check it out. But check out some of my other videos, because this is a review, basically, what I'm doing today. But a lot of my other videos aren't so much reviews as they are commentary on the state of the gaming hobby, which you might find very interesting. So check those out, and if you like it, subscribe. But anyways, in that live stream, somebody pointed out that I've done, you know, page through reviews of Lion and Dragon, but I never did one of uh, Dark Albion. So I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> I, I, uh, I can't believe I had kind of missed it. Um, Dark Albion the Rose War is a setting book. This is the first thing you have to understand. It's an OSR book, but it is a setting book. It's not a... Um, an, a game. It's not its own complete set of rules, although there are some very, very basic OSR type rules in the back that became the basis for the game that was eventually Lion and Dragon. But Lion and Dragon are the rules of playing medieval authentic roleplay, and Dark Alpian is an example of a setting of medieval authentic roleplaying. And as you can see, Dark Albion the Rose War. So this is a a version, you could say, of England. It is, it's, it's actually very, very similar to the historical England, with the difference being that the world worked the way that medieval people imagined it to work, including the fact that there were supernatural creatures and things like that. And there's a, there's a few changes that I made in the game setting to kind of accommodate certain things. There are a few things that are a bit um, anachronistic. And a few things that I did just for kicks. <laughs> and a couple of things I did because at the time I thought it was necessary to. Now I'm not so sure. The big one in that is that... A, see, one of the principles, if you've, if you've watched some of my videos, I've talked about how one of the most fundamental parts of the medieval zeitgeist is monotheism. You can't actually play a medieval authentic game if you're using D&D &D style polytheism, which is also a really stupid thing that doesn't look at all like real polytheism either. But the point is, if you're going to run a medieval authentic game, you have to have a religion with just one god. It doesn't necessarily have to be Christianity, but it has to be something that looks a lot like medieval Christianity, right? With a centralized church, with a hierarchy, with its own bureaucracy and its own, um, its own systems, internal bureaucratic systems. And with it, with it, with political power, but also with a, an absolute temporal dominance of the religious field. So, um, in in the Dark Albion setting, part of what I did is I basically the Catholic Church is in the Dark Albion setting, except I filed the, the numbers off, and instead of being the Catholic Church, it was the Church of the Unconquered Son. Um, and I did that because I knew that there were some gamers that just wouldn't be able to. There are some. I care a little bit less about this, but that there would be some that would, you know, be uncomfortable playing in a game with Catholic dominance. I don't really give a crap, but um, more importantly, I think there would be some that would play it, but would just be absolutely unable to get past their present day perceptions and biases about the Catholic Church. And so they wouldn't, they wouldn't, you know, they might not be able to really handle it or handle, you know, playing interacting with the, the the real church whereas if you just change the name from Jesus to Saul Invictus you know suddenly that becomes perfectly fine and the, all those prejudices vanish right so I I did it more for that it wasn't an anti-catholic statement it was an attempt at av 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 avoiding certain people having presumptions that made that would get in the way of their ability to play the setting properly, like to have the, the proper respect for the church in the setting, for example. Because for, for whatever reason, you, know, you have some people there, you know, Father, Father Ben touched them in the rectory, and then so, from then on, they've, uh, they've had, uh-oh, that's a meatball. They've had a hate on for the Catholic Church, and, and so they, or, you know, they, they were just required to go to 
to Eucharist school or something like that in a catechism, and it pissed them off. So from then on, they, they didn't like the Catholic Church, and so if you put the Catholic Church in a game, they'll have all kinds of weird reactions, and it'll be a bad thing. You can't sit there because I'm about to open the book. Can you can you understand that, Meeple? Come on. No, you can't sit on the book. That's even worse. Yeah, you're sitting on the book. How am I going to do a review if I can't even open the book, Meeple? You just don't care. Well, I'm going to push you off, and I won't care. <laughs> anyway, so that's that's one of the big, big changes that's in there. But But basically... The setting is medieval England, late medieval England, right? At the point in time, actually, where England goes from being in the Middle Ages at the start of that war to being whoop, in the Renaissance at the end of it. All right. And um, that means you're going to be playing a historical game. It's a historical game that has magic and monsters, but it's a historical game. I'll point out Dark Albion, like Lion and Dragon and Cults of Chaos, was published by um, Dom Publishing... And uh, it was all the edit editor work and layout and illustration work and everything was made. Can you please get out of the way? <laughs> it was done by uh, by Dominic Cruze, and he is just amazing, as you can see. There, this this book has like illustrations on every single page. Right, there isn't a page that doesn't have an illustration on it. You can't sit there. <laughs> all right, there we go. So I put in here some of the same, if you, if you saw the review or you own Lion and Dragon, I put in some of the same basic assumptions of what you're doing, how to make the, the setting feel medieval, medieval authentic. So the importance of um, you know, it being kind of gritty, social status being a huge, huge deal compared to regular games, the, the way women were treated in the, the, the period the way magic was kind of distrusted in the period, but was also considered very important in um, in that it was mixed in with what we would consider science or academia. Um, the importance of the church as the upholder of law, of, of not just goodness, but also the, the basis for the entire concept of the divine right of kings and things like that. Um, the danger of chaos, right? The danger of um, heresy and of savagery being a, a peril to a very fragile level of civilization. Here you have a fantastic he hex map of, uh, of, of uh, late medieval England, basically. And the first important section is a big gazetteer of Albion, where it talks about the, the local government and religion, Albion being basically England, right? Uh, magic, minorities, danger, regions. Um, and I go, here's a, another very, very cool player character map of London. Um, you get a breakdown of, of London, and then after that you get a breakdown of all the different major areas <coughs> of the... Um, of, well, of England, of Albion, of the setting. And um, in each section, I talk about the history a little bit. I talk about what's going on as of the present day of the camp, of the setting. By the way, the setting is made to be played throughout the entire course of the 30 years long um, War of the Roses. So they're, they're, it's set up so you can start the game around 1455 and you finish it around 1485. Um, and, and you can play any period in between, or you can go through the whole thing. The, um, the coverage of the different regions and what's going on there, uh, more maps, as you can see. Really, really great map work here. Again, Dominic Cruzet, I can take no credit for it. Um, in the different regions, I talk about who the local governance is, and also... There, was, there was some very uh, big efforts at research here about local legends and stories that I now incorporate as details of the setting area that you can make into like you know adventure seeds for when the player characters are running around that area, right? So I talk about some of the local monster stories, ghost stories, fairy stories, etc., as if they are a real thing in the setting, which they are a real thing in the setting. Um, things that your characters could end up having to encounter. More maps. Um, 
And so this is this is basically, as you can see, it's quite a lengthy section where I'm going through all of the different parts of England and then some of the surrounding areas, the Isle of Man here, um, and then Wales, quite a large section on Wales, which of course by then was part of the English crown. And then I get to the areas of the the border regions I talk about you know I talk about Scotland I talk about um, the continent where there's the port of Calais which is still the last holding the English have on the continent and then the vicious frog land and its frogmen rulers <laughs> um, the debatable land which is an area in you know, on north of the wall in in Scotland. Um, and everything, everything, everything that I'm putting in here, apart from the fantastical flourishes, right? Like, technically, France wasn't ruled by chaos-worshipping frogmen. But <laughs> apart from that, um, that sort of stuff, uh, everything here is done with, like, real medieval uh, historical accuracy, right? So the debatable land was a real place um, in the border area between Scotland and England, where there was basically, for a, quite a long time, a sort of lawlessness, and it was just this kind of chaotic area, a no-man's land, right? Um, then I go to a briefer s section on the kingdoms of the continent of, of Europe. So there's Frogland, um, Burgundy, Lorraine, Savoy, all kinds of areas there. Switch sides here. There we go. That's going to be better. Um... Here you get a, a hex map, again, of uh, all of Europe at the time. The Teutonic Holdings, the Hanseatic League, the Northlands, the Polish Commonwealth, Wallachia, and then stuff that's even further away, out far from normal civilization like Russia. Um, and so that whole section, all, all, all of the first part there, this is the gazetteer, right? And so it's a very complete gazetteer of places that your characters can go. Second section, law and justice, I talk about what are some of the laws, including some of the things that you never usually see in a supposedly medieval fantasy game. But here you get stuff like sumptuary laws, right? There's stuff you're not allowed to wear if you're from the wrong social class, right? So for example... Only people who are knights or higher could wear anything with silver on them. They couldn't. You can't carry silver weapons or, or, a, or even wear a silver button if you're not at least a knight or from a knightly family, right? So uh, that's that's a big deal. What, uh, arms control, right? Like uh, in most fantasy games, you have your D and D characters running around in full plate mail and and multiple weapon, multiple melee weapons down the streets of Waterdeep, right? And that's just not. That's not medievally authentic either, right? Inside a city, unless you're you're a, an officer of the city, you're not allowed to carry weapons. Again, except if you're a noble, because you're allowed to carry a sword if you're a noble. They can't prevent it. So, stuff like that. Um, details on how justice works and how to escape. Oh, come on, me, Bob. No, 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 no. Why do you always want to sit on a book? She's a very studious cat. She just... <laughs> she'll really sit there and consider the text. Um, stuff on trials and lawyers, trial by combat, torture, all that good sort of stuff. Uh, the crowner, lists of fines for different crimes. Uh, because you know that your characters are going to be getting into trouble, right? <laughs> so this is a way to look at that. Next thing you've got is the history of Albion, where I talk about very briefly, you know, one of the things I don't like about setting books that I've seen other people do is sometimes you get like these fantasy settings and there'll be like a section of 12 pages detailing the last 50,000 years of that setting and some massive scope, right? And it's all stuff that you're never going to actually use in the goddamn campaign, right? Instead of, you know, what I want to know is what's going to be happening in the present and near future. So I do a short part where I, I, I give a summary, including the different kings of Albion and stuff like that. But that's it, right? That's like three pages. And then I dedicate a very considerable section. Still going. All of this, that's from page 97 to page 122, let's put it, 
um, to a year by year future timeline of events, right? So this can tell you, if you start at the very beginning, it could tell you, you know, what's happening right now. And then each year, new adventure opportunities that arise, new events that happen, important details. And there's a mix of like important political events. Obviously, if there are big battles that are fought, um, you know, there's some, a couple of shorter sections there for the, for the first couple of years, just to give some recent events. Um, and, but then there's also some weird events that happened that are based on real life weird events that happened, you know, so, so you've got like stuff that, you know, the sighting of a wolf man in the Yorkshire Moors, right? Or something like that. that, that was based on something real that happened. So I put it in there or something that anyways, that was a real account, right? Um, and stuff that there, therefore you can have a mix and you can decide when you're running a, a campaign of Dark Albion, whether you want it to be um, very kind of based on politics and war, so like a, a kind of a Game of Thrones type of campaign, or whether you want it to be that you're like just an adventuring party kind of peripheral to those events and trying to make do. Um, you could be mercenaries, you could be, a, you know, city rats living in, you know, working in the gangs of, of London or York or Bristol. Um so there's, there's a wide variety. You could be a team, you know, if you have Cults of Chaos especially, you can be a team working for the clerical order, hunting down heretics and, and witches, you know. Um, that's, that's what Cults of Chaos is especially good for. I, I don't remember if I've done a, a review video of Cults of Chaos either. <laughs> Once again, drugs, years of, of drugs all through college. It's like <laughs> burned out my memory. So if you guys can, if any one of you know if I've done a review already, a video about Cults of Chaos, let me know. And if I haven't, I'll do one of those sometime soon too. Um, so you get this whole thing where you can basically it charts out all of the, the events of each year. And obviously you, there, you can add a lot in each year that you play. You can do it. You can do a campaign where you're playing, you know, just a few adventures a year. The characters are aging as they go along and they, they live through all of the, well, if they survive, they live through all of the war of the roses, right? That's kind of the default. That's what my original dark Albion campaign was right. Um, where, you know, there were even a couple of characters that made it to the end. Um, but you can do a lot of other stuff, too. It's it's all open to you, right? Next, there's a section about character classes. And so one of the central things that's important is the social class, where you get details on, you know, how likely you are to be that class and what what each of those classes mean and what they what benefits and responsibilities they have. I also have a section here on, you know, uh, to randomly roll where your character was uh, born, what area, and uh, prior events that happened to him. This is basically a very similar one to the prior events table in the Lion and Dragon book, practically identical. Um, and there's also a much more expanded set of prior event tables in uh, the Old School Companion, but this is where it first got published, right? Then I talk about, because, you know, the default of some of these people are going to be playing their own OSR games here, because uh, this came out before Lion and Dragon. So I'm talking about the different kind of D, D character classes and how they would change and fit in this setting or would not right so i'm i'm pointing out for example you're not playing i mean the dm can do anything he likes but if you're going by the default you're not going to play dwarves and elves and halflings because there aren't such things there aren't friendly you know demi-human races that interact with you you're all humans here right but anything that is an inhuman intelligent race is is at the very least extremely dangerous and and at the worst actively evil and seeking to, to damage mankind, right? Here you have a list of names and um, surnames, English, Scot, and Welsh, for you to roll for your character to have. There's a section on currency and equipment, which includes sections on coins and equipment stuff. A lot, Some of these parts have been reprinted, basically, in Lion and Dragon, in some cases with slight alterations. Um, but as you can see, those sections are both relatively short. Next, we have a section on Noble Houses of, of Albion, where there's a system for generating you, um, a kind of domain management system. So if you want to play a campaign where all the player characters are members of a single retinue of some noble, uh, maybe one of the player characters is a noble, a member of that fam of a certain family. So you, I, I set up a fairly, <coughs> fairly basic, because I don't want to go into too much complexity with it, 
a fairly basic set of rules for how to manage their level of, of wealth, power, and influence. And um, with random events that'll happen in their, you know, in their territories, and with rules for how that affects, you know, major, major, you know, crown level royal politics, uh, things that they can attempt to do with their influence, basically. And of course, a conflict resolution system for large scale battles, which is, again, this is not like battle system or chain mail, right? These are not like super intricate rules. It's a pretty straightforward system to, in a simple way, calculate where, where if two big armies fought, you know, who would be most likely to win with a random element thrown in, and then that's it. So you, it's an abstract way to resolve really big battles that could happen. Um, with some tables to include, like, if you want to just quick roll what happened to the player characters in the table in the, in the event as well. People of Interest is this huge section of medieval biographies of all the important dudes and dudettes that were involved in the War of the Roses. And given that, you know, almost all of your favorite Game of Thrones character is based on one of these people that is in here, you know, or is an amalgam of a couple of people that were in here, um, you're, you're going to find that these are really interesting NPCs. And of course, this is ma meant most of all, if you're playing that high level Game of Thrones type royal campaign, right, where they're the, the, the player characters are getting involved in the war at the at the topmost level of society with with being you know either they're all nobles or one of them is a noble or you know there's they're or they're interacting with the big movers and shakers of the war so here you can see all of them get their heraldic shields all of them get a breakdown of the events of their lives some of them are quite short right just little details because they're very minor people but people that you would not nevertheless want to know because of like if you're in a certain area and that family the Courtenays, let's say were influential in that family, you want to know who are the Courtenays that are alive at the time and what they were like, right? And what they did or didn't do. Um, and so it, it notes their allegiances, you know, if they were York, Lancaster, or flipped around. Here's the, the, the Kingmaker, probably one of the most important people in the entire period. Um, and so you've got this, this big section of a biography of, of important and powerful NPCs, right? Um, that is basically a history text, you know, like you could, you could really treat it in that way. Um, then there's a section of Game Master Secrets where it points out some secret knowledge about some of these, some of these characters um, that put, you might not want NPCs to know, so I'm not going to linger on it. Next we get to the area of the, the Church of the Unconquered Son, the Pontifex, and so here I give brief biographies of the popes of the time, and the stuff that they got up to. Let's mention, you know, I did say I have nothing against the Catholic Church. However, the Catholic Church in the 15th century, they were, that was pretty much them at their most corrupt. Remember, there's a reason why just after this period of history, the Reformation happened, right? It was because the, the popes specifically had become, the papacy had become really, really iffy. You know, like, not good. Um, then other stuff about rulers in the con continents, right? So I give you the, the biographies of some of the important figures, right? Philip of Burgundy, um, Casimir Jagiello, the great Poli the greatest Polish king, probably. Matthias Corvinus, Vlad Tepes. Yeah, yeah. Your characters could end up literally having to go fight Dracula in this game. <laughs> so, because, of course, as part of the story, after the, you know... After Tepesh's supposed death, he comes back. <laughs> so that's something. You, you, you could give Ravenloft a real run for its money with the actual original dude. Sorcery and Secrets is... Um, this whole section, if you play Lion and Dragon, is kind of unnecessary. Luckily, it's not very large. But um, th this was done to give a kind of how to make your regular OSR game. So if you're not playing Lion and Dragon, but you're playing like some edition of D&D or Swords and Wizardry or whatever, how to pare down your spell list to make it at least more reflective of medieval authenticity and not just, you know, throwing fireballs around. So like one of the spells that is taken away is fireball, obviously. And then I put in the rules for summoning, which also end up in later on in Lion and Dragon. And these are the only, this is the only magical technique 
that I that I put in Lion and Dragon that that uh, appears here. All the other magical techniques in Lion and Dragon do not appear here because they were things that were developed as I went along later, and I just didn't want to have. I, I hadn't really fleshed all of them out in the way I did ultimately when I actually wrote the text. It's one thing to be playing your own house rules. It's another thing to to write a set of rules for a game, right? So this is all um, the, basically the same system of demon summoning as you see in Lion and Dragon, but it's a very cool system. Lots of exciting things that can happen from there. Some details on making magic items. This, again, is mostly um, overruled by the rules in Lion and Dragon if you're looking mechanically, but it's uh, if you don't own Lion and Dragon and you just want to use Dark Albion for your D&D game, um, it's pretty important. And I include a few important um, basic types of magic items. The, the key in, just like in Lion and Dragon, in Dark Albion as the setting, um, magic items are very, very rare. And so having anything magic at all is super special, right? And most things that are magic will usually either be a very minor kind of magic. So like, for example, the, the sword plus zero, right? Which is to say that it's just a sword that can hurt things that magic usually could, that, that usually could only be hurt by magic, right? Um, or they're super duper powerful, like the sacred lance, right? So... The Holy Lance, I give details of where it is, because uh, you know, it's broken up in multiple pieces throughout the Europe at this time. So literally where the areas of what were supposedly the Lancia Santa, the, the, the Holy Lance, you know, uh, the lance that pierced the, the, the side of Christ, um, where they're located in, the, um, in, the, in Europe at that time and what their supposed attributes were. Then I get to a, we get to a section on poisons and curative herbs. And this is a short, slightly shorter version of the section in Lion and Dragon again. So there are a few places where there are um, overrides, right? Like where there's where they overlap with each other, Lion and Dragon and and Dark Albion. But I wanted to, th remember this came first, and so I wanted to put all those in Lion and Dragon, so a person wouldn't have to be obliged to buy Dark Albion to have that information. So next section is adventuring in Albion, and here you get. Some random encounter tables along the roadways of, of, um, of England um, with details about the sort of things that you can come across. Hang on. I'm actually going to put this back here because I just, that's, that's a bookmark, basically. As you can see, I am still using this, obviously, because I'm currently running a Lion and Dragon campaign. So, you know, you might encounter dangerous lepers, highwaymen, mysterious strangers. Um, encountering monsters on roadways is very rare. Now, this is something, these rules for encounters on roads is something I didn't include in Lion and Dragon. In Lion and Dragon, I included rules for encounters on, in borderland regions. So they kind of complement each other. Here also is a section on cities, villages, and towns. There's someone's character sheet, Roger of Norwich. I think that was from an early play test of... Uh, of uh, uh, of Lion and Dragon before I published it. Anyway, um, cities will have, you know, random events that could be happening and random encounters that you can have in the city. Um, information on making contacts and things like that. And then there's some, like, adventure locations that would make sense in a medieval authentic context. So, ancient tombs, with an example... So there you have, you know, there are dungeons you can go to, but, you know, they've got to be dungeons in a kind of context that makes sense, right? Arcadian catacombs that can be found beneath certain cities. Um, barrow mounds, of course, England is absolutely chock full of barrow mounds. Um, goblin warrens, so a warren of goblins under a ruined keep on a, on a hill. Um details on going to court, right? So the royal court or a lordly court are both very important places. So I got some adventure seeds for the court, going to the fair and the tourney, keeping watch in a frontier fort near the, you know, by the wall. <laughs> um, and then we get at the very end to appendices. So first is an appendix on the clerical order. So in this game, if you're a cleric, you're part of the church, but not all you know, the priests of the church don't do magic. Just like in the Middle Ages, a normal priest didn't do magic. They couldn't make miracles happen. They were just priests, right? So 
Clerics in a medieval authentic game are the replacement for basically saints and for religious crusader knights. So what, what I've had is uh, the clerics are an order in Dark Albion based on the, the Templar knights, um, you, you know, a religious ruled order. Uh, of in, and in fact, in the old school companion, I include the constitution of the clerical order, which is directly derived from the constitution of the Templars you know, their rules and regulations for how to govern themselves. And so the um, the clerics are a specific part of the church that answer only directly to the to the pontifex, to the pope, and uh, have separate authority from the regular church hierarchies, like the bishops and things like that, which can sometimes cause some conflicts, but it also, you know, it means that they have certain autonomies, but they also have certain restrictions, um, and they work with local rulers, so a cleric can be assigned to you know, be the personal cleric of a, of an important Lord and then has to, you know, they, they have to be obedient and provide services for the Lord, but they, but within, the, Hey, that's good. I just slid it right off, but within the limits of, of course, not permitting that Lord to commit sin, right? Um, at least not grave sins. Next, uh, the section on the Knights of the Star, which are like the highest order of knighthood in the in Albion, a replacement basically for the Knights of the Garter. And then you get to uh, Appendix P, which is RPG Pundit's Quick and Dirty House Rules. So uh, these are the rules that are like the, the ancestor of Lion and Dragon. These were the house rules that I used um, in my own first Dark Albion campaign. They evolved into these rules from what had originally been um, started as a Lamentations of the Flame Princess campaign. And then I said, well, I want to make, it's not medieval authentic enough, so I wanted to make it more so. But it's it's quite short, as you can see. Like, it's not, it's, you know, Lion and Dragon takes these rules and vastly expands them to make them more complete. Um, then the next section, I've got to mention that I'm not the sole writer of this. This was co-written with uh, Dominic Cruzet. I gave him co-writing credit but, uh, of course, I wrote the vast majority of everything. He wrote some parts of the adventures um, that, that, that are in the section on, you know, adventuring locations I just mentioned. A couple of other sections that he wanted to add things to, like he, he added some of the section on law and justice. And then he wrote the, all these appendixes that come after Appendix P, which is the fantastic heroes and wizardry stuff. Because, of course... Uh, Dom Publishing publishes its own OSR RPG called Fantastic Heroes and Wizardry. And I told Dom that obviously he's very welcome to include that, uh, you know, conversion notes or whatever he wanted to from Fantastic Heroes and Wizardry. Um, sorry, Fantastic Heroes and Witchery, I should say, um, into his, uh, into, into the book because, you know, I figured it would be nice for him to be able to have that. And he put a large section full of new classes and new details for Fantastic Heroes that uh, um, that I'm sure anyone who has that book will find really cool, right? Like, he did does his own versions here of clerics and head witches and magisters, like, um, that are basically, again, um, Fantastic Heroes is an OSR game, so you can use any of these classes in your own OSR game as a replacement for the standard classes, like say you're doing, um, say that you're playing, I don't know, uh, I've gone blank now. <laughs> say you're playing Lamentations, okay, and you don't want to use Lamentation classes, you can use these classes, right? Um, Or, you know, or Swords and Wizardry, or Labyrinth Lord, any of those, right? That had momentarily escaped my recollection. Uh, then there's even more classes. Then there's a section on Albion's low magic. Um, some very interesting details, like he did his own version of the planes for it, right? Like, this is all, none of this is me. All of this section is stuff that Dominic Cruzet added. And some of it is quite cool, and would be stuff that you could definitely use as well. But, uh, yeah, so that is basically, at the back, full color map. That is basically Dark Albion The Rose War, for everybody who is curious about it. Um, you can get Dark Albion in multiple places and in multiple versions. So this is 
the hard cover version. There's also a soft cover, which is exactly the same, but in soft cover, which you can buy, these ones you can buy either at Drive Through RPG or on Amazon. So you can do a search for Dark Albion the Rose War and you'll find it on Amazon. You'll be able to buy it in hard cover and soft cover. Um, you can also get the PDF in Drive Through RPG, which I, for, for reasons that probably are fuckery, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, the Drive Through RPG did something where we had to put the PDF sales page separate from the print. So you might do it, if you do a search on Drive Through RPG, you might, the first thing you click on might just be only the PDF. And you might think, oh, there isn't a print version. Or you might just get the print version and think, oh, there isn't any PDF. But that's because for some reason, those were put into two different pages and they couldn't put them back, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't eh, put them together without losing our bestseller status. So I think that's, again, every single time I've released something on, on drive through there's been a bit of fucking around with the bestseller status thing, right? And it just drives me nuts. But um, because I'm, I'm pretty sure that if, if it wasn't for stuff like that, my games would have a higher bestseller status there than they do. They, a lot of them, you know, there, there's uh, Dark Albion is a gold bestseller. Even just the PDF version is a gold bestseller. Plus this version, I think, is a silver, like the, the hardcover page is on top of that, I think either a silver or Electrum bestseller, right? So it's like, um, they, it's not like they're stopping me or something. But anyway, so if you're looking at it on drive through, you've got to keep that in mind. If you want to get the, you can get it either in print or in PDF, but they're not on the same page. But besides this, you can also pick up the hardcover version, this hardcover version, not the soft cover, only in hardcover, uh, on Lulu, if you still use Lulu, because some people do. And uh, on Lulu, curiously, there's also an alternate cover version of Dark Albion, and that's the only place you can buy it, on Lulu, which is identical in everything inside, but it just has a, a separate cover. It has a, a cover with a different illustration, it's a dark border, and in the center it has a very famous portrait about choosing the roses, which is, you know, this one, this is the one we decided to go with as the main cover, because it's more action-packed. But the other one is much more, I think, uh, it's a classic piece of art re re relating to the War of the Roses. But if you want that one, I think they're both really cool covers. The rest of the book is the same. So those are the places that you can pick them up. And uh, yeah, check them out. So thank you for listening to all this. Um, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Like this video. Share this video anywhere you think people would be interested in learning more about Dark Albion. And if you, uh, if you want to support me... Well, pick up Dark Albion for starters, right? But let's say you, you don't want to get Dark Albion or you already have Dark Albion. Well, you could just send me money. I've got it in the description below. There'll be a PayPal link and a Patreon link. If you want to throw money at me, I'm not going to say no. But I would recommend you check out the RPG Pundit Presents PDF series, which is also going to be linked to in the description below. Um, if, you're, if you maybe right now can't afford to buy one of my books, and they're not very expensive. I think the hardcover... It's $35, but let's say you don't have $35, but you have $3. Well, the RPG Pride Presents series is a set of 102, 103 right now um, PDFs that all range from like 99 cents to five bucks, right? So very cheap. Each of them have a different topic. They're all based on OSR stuff. Some of them are gonzo fantasy, weird fantasy, and a lot of them are obviously medieval authentic fantasy, stuff that you can use with the Dark Albion setting, and a really interesting variety of things. You're going to find something that you'll like there, something that you'd probably be able to use. There's Meatball again. Um, and if you, if you pick one up, then you're getting something for yourself that if you're a gamer, you're going to be able to use in your gaming, but it's also like you're buying me a coffee, so that would be very welcome. Um, but check it out. Check out <laughs> Dark Albion. <laughs> Sorry. Check out check out Meatball's ass, I guess. Check out Dark Alvian, and uh, thank you very much for watching this video. Currently smoking, well, I, I had to put it out because I was trying to deal with that, holding on to a phone and wrestling with a cat, but uh, this is a bladder diplomat plus argento natural. <laughs>